everybody. Good morning. So good to see y'all here in this beautiful Lord's Day and, uh, and Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And the dads out there, we'll talk about that more uh, throughout our time together this morning. I hope you've had a blessed day and uh, it's so good to see you. It's good to be back with you. I think I about lost my job while I was gone. Dr. Gaskins did a wonderful job. He enjoyed being with you. He put you on Facebook. He said all kinds of positive things about you. And of course, I knew he would. And I'm so glad he could be here. I so appreciate it. We had a great convention. And um, I will be talking more about that Wednesday night. I'll give you a little bit about it later on today. But um, anyway, we just stand and let me pray with you. And we're going to sing some, some great songs about our Savior. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come together. The church has gathered to worship you, and we enjoy fellowship with one another, and that's important as we will talk about that today in the text. Thank you, Lord, that we celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day and family. Um, not everybody's situation is the same or experience or memories, but your word declares to us and gives a, a great uh, depiction of what the Christian family unit should look like. And I pray that we would be ever mindful of that. And today, as we do celebrate and recognize earthly fathers, may it also be a time when we recognize and honor our Heavenly Father. And I thank you, Lord, for calling us your children as we place our faith in you. And I pray that if there's anyone here today in our midst or listening or watching on Facebook that doesn't know you and is not your child according to the faith that they have have withheld, I pray that they would uh, place their faith in you, Lord, and that by your grace, through faith in Jesus alone, they would come to know you and be grafted into the vine and adopted as children. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your presence today. Have your will and way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Remain standing and let's sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing.
created you. He knows your name. He knows every little thing about you. This is just a reminder of that as we sing, He knows my name.
Sue. Can I tell them what you said this morning, Sue? <laughs> I have witnesses during the praise team practice. Sue asked that they turn me up and remind her over there because she needed to hear me more. So I just want to put that on the record. That <laughs> Normally I get told just the opposite. It is so good to be back with you. And um, I had a great time at the convention. And if you're uh, interested in what went on at the convention, please ask. Um, uh, Wednesday night, I'll go into some, some depth with that. Um, we have, uh, we used a lot of ballots this week. Uh, I have a couple left over, but uh, we used a lot of ballots. Uh, it was a great time of business, but more importantly than that, it was a great time of worship. And um, just, we got a lot of things done. I have a book of reports here if you want to see the things as the different folks reported on what's been happening over the last year. Um, if you watched live streaming um, sessions, then you saw some of the things that, that we talked about. Um, the commissioning of many missionaries, uh, some great pastors speaking. I, I was at the pastor's conference the first couple of days and then the actual convention. Uh, the, the latter two days, and it was just a wonderful time, but I'll share that with you Wednesday night, and take questions if you have some questions. I don't know what the media picks up on. I haven't watched any of the uh, things that came across, maybe the networks or social media, so if you heard something that was troubling to you, um, first of all, uh, take it with a grain of salt that you're getting it from the media. And the second thing is try to find the truth. And um, the good thing about those applications that I mentioned to you that you could load on your phone or your computer, you can still go back and revisit those sessions that we had. They were recorded, so you can still go back to SBC Annual um, or Baptist Press, and you can find those meetings and what was said. And so many times things were taken out of context. But our, our convention overall still stands on God's holy word and is interested in being Christ-centered and evangelizing the world, taking the gospel to people that don't know Christ, making disciples. And this was reiterated over and over and over during the whole time there. So I feel like we're still on right track as a convention, as a denomination, and heading in the right direction. And I'm very, very pleased and so thankful to be able to go. Thank you for being a church that allows me to go and, and finances the trip, and, and it was just a wonderful time. And for me, and for most pastors that go, it's a time of conviction. It's a time of uh, remembering what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to be doing it, why we're supposed to be doing it, and the focus of ministry. And you think, well, that should be a no-brainer, but... After a while, things can become mundane and routine, just like in any other vocation. So it's for me, it's it's something that I need to keep me on track and to light a fire within me about why we do what we do. So thank you again for allowing me to go. And thank you for taking part in the services and things uh, while I was gone. I understand that the children's moment was much better. Than I <laughs> and I have, I've told Cecilia she. Take that anytime she wants to do that, which I was hoping was every Sunday, but we'll yeah, see. To I, what I need yeah, to tighten up. To up. Um, I think she did a wonderful job, and I appreciate that. I appreciate those that took part in the music and all the things that go into our, your worship time and your Bible study time on Wednesday nights, opening up and locking up and turning the lights on and off. And there's a lot that goes into it, so I, I'm so thankful. But I, I'm so glad to be back with you. I, I look forward to coming back and spending time with you. And I was hoping that my office would still be my office when I come back. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I wanted to share a couple things with you um, in your bulletin. Please note the things coming up uh, in the next couple weeks, and especially the Independence Day cookout, which is, is happening on Sunday the, the 30th at 6.30 at the picnic shelter. And note the details here. The church will provide hot dogs, hamburgers, water, sweet, and unsweet tea. 
Please bring side dishes, desserts, and if you prefer to drink something other than water or tea, please bring your own drink. And so the soft drinks, if you want a soft drink, just bring those. Uh, but tea and water will be provided. So take note of that. It's at 630, June the 30th. Uh, be aware of that. And also, um, the Christian Motorcyclist Association, when is the, the fundraiser and the thing they're having in July? Do you remember the date of that? July 20th. The 20th. The 20th? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Christian Motorcyclist Association is going to use the property here to meet and have their fundraiser and to gather together. So if you want to participate as far as helping out or preparing for that, and I noticed uh, the property maintenance team has been busy and, and they have gotten so much done out there at the picnic shelter preparing for the time that we have there on the 30th. I so appreciate all the things that they did. Um, I, I haven't even seen it all. I've seen some of it out there, but I appreciate all that they're doing. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, all the things coming up. Uh, other announcements, Bible study opportunities. Um, any announcements that uh, aren't in here that you that you need to know about, just let us know. We appreciate that greatly. Is there a leadership team meeting on Tuesday night? Is there a leadership team meeting on Tuesday? Did we side, decide about that this coming Tuesday? I can't remember right at the moment. Okay. Let me check on that, Roberta, and I'll, I'll let you know. <coughs> or let, we'll do a mass announcement. Thank you for the question. Uh, <coughs> please make a note of all the prayer requests on the back of your bulletin. Praises. Uh, missionaries and um, others there. Uh, we're thankful that I see some of you folks that the other week, last week, were, or a week before, were in the hospital or going through some very painful and uncomfortable things are here now. So I'm, that's a praise to our Lord for bringing you through and um, healing your bodies. And um, thank you that you can be here today. Uh, going through the memorial services and different things. A lot was going on a couple weeks ago. And even this last week, but it's so good to see you and to be with you. Thank you all for visiting with us today. If you're a visitor here today, thank you so much. Make sure you grab something on the way out. I think we still have some cups or something back there for our visitors. So um, keep that in mind. Can you testify, brother? <laughs> I have a question. Yes, What's happening on Saturday, June 29th? I think that's a misprint. We don't okay, have you. Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking he was testifying. I was I think it's just under 30. All right. Thank you. Charles is going to be here by himself. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you for that. And uh, again, if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. What is today other than the Lord's Day? That's first and foremost. Father's, Father's Day. And uh, if you are a dad, father, um, however you want to, to say that, daddy, father, dad, would you stand for just a moment, please? All dads, stand, please. By the way, if you're a dad of a baby in the womb, you're a dad, so please stand. <laughs> All right, let's give them a hand, please. All right. All right. Don't get me seated. In just a moment, I was going to ask the children to give y'all a present today for Father's Day. But I got three willing ladies over here that are going to help Miss Doris. So it was four willing ladies. I asked them, I said, if y'all hand out presents, you got to sit down and go through the children's service. They weren't willing to do that. So I will. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> thank you. But we're going to uh, give you a, a present today to all our dads. And I want to say thank you, fathers, for being here. And there is our, our community, our, our culture, rather, is so determined to divide family and to tear family down. It's a, it's a great tool of Satan. But I want you to know that Father's Day is one day that we need to recognize the importance of being a dad. And most importantly, a, a Christian dad, a dad that follows God and his example and is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Dads have a, a, such an important role. Today, there are three different aspects of this to think about. The dad that we had or have, the dad that we might be, and the Heavenly Father that we have and look forward to being with for all eternity. So, and I am, just like I say on Mother's Day, I'm well aware that everybody's experience with their father uh, is different, and some are very good, some are very bad. So Father's Day holds different um, meaning to different people. I understand that. But I want you to know something. Your Heavenly Father loves you. 
He's always perfect. He's never made a mistake. And he always desires time with you. So he's a, a father that you can always depend on. He's always faithful and always cares for you. We just sang about that. A father who knows you by name and cares about even the smallest parts of your life. So you can be thankful today and recognize that you have a heavenly father that created you, that desires a relationship with you. And if you are a, a father here today, I understand the culture wants to tear you apart. But in the scripture and throughout the time since the church was formed, the role of a Christian father is paramount to the way that family follows in, in the Lord's footsteps. It is so important for a dad to be the example and to lead uh, their children and their family to Christ. Does that mean that we have to be perfect dads? If you know any perfect dads, let me know. We never met one except our Heavenly Father was perfect so we still make mistakes and still have regrets, still have things that we wish we could take back I'm certain. But dads your role is certainly important today, especially in God's economy and the way that he's brought family together and created the Institute of Family. Thank you for being here and thank you for your role in the church and leading Back when the churches started, they met in homes. And the elder of the church was also the elder of the home. Uh, it was the older man that led that congregation and that family. And that role was so important. So thank you for being here, ladies. My willing participants, <laughs> if you're a dad today, would you raise your hand as they uh, come by to hand you a gift? And it's just our way of appreciating you and thanking you for being here let me know that we are glad to be able to um, participate with you in the celebration of Father's Day. Also, as I always say on Mother's Day, or try to, some men are not biological fathers or adoptive fathers, but as believers in Christ, we can always have a, a fatherly influence to young men and women who need to know what it is to have a Christian dad but didn't have that luxury. So fathers or, or men, if you're not a biological dad uh, or have uh, children that you've adopted or uh, stepchildren, please understand you still can have a very strong Christian influence. Thank you. As a male uh, in that way. So raise your hand. Make sure they get to you. I always thought it was something that um, was missing when we talk about the sanctity of human life and we recognize an embryo, fetus, as a living being, a human being, but yet on Father's Day, we don't recognize the men that are, have them on the way. So uh, I wanted to make that clear today, even though we have at least one in the congregation. We have others. Y'all just have a secret that nobody knows. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, ladies. Y'all weren't as chatty as the children, but you did good. Y'all <laughs> are ready for a sermon. Ready for Yeah. You got to do as good as it was I can't do that well. I can't answer. Thank you, Dara. All right. We're going to sing this song. It says, Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. He is the perfect day. Would you stand and listen to me?
it's always good to tell people we love them. We sing that song, we say, well, I, I love God. When's the last time we told him that we love him? And so we sing songs that say just that. Y'all have any good memories or something funny that you remember from dad growing up that you can repeat? <laughs> things for us is to get past what we came to believe as children in a negative sense, whether it was from mom or dad or some guardian or grandparents or siblings or whomever. Words are hard to get rid of in our minds and it shapes who we are. I'm thankful to have had a dad that disciplined me on the rare occasion that I needed it. <laughs> um, that's my story. But um, it's so so grateful that he took us to worship with the church, and that was not an option. We didn't get up Sunday morning deciding if we wanted to go with them to church service. We we were going, <laughs> and if we didn't get up in time, we were going our pajamas because we were taking to church. But anyway, I'm thankful for that. Anybody have anything else you remember? Anything that was uh, just stands out in your mind about your dad? Peggy. My dad, he had a million sayings, okay? And I think of them almost every day, so I can come up and say, oh man, he said that. I remember we would go ask, we were teenagers, and ask him for a dollar, you know, to go to the dance or wherever we were going. He said, oh, this is my last dollar. It's all, it's the only thing that stands between me and starvation. <laughs> Yeah, it was in my heart. Oh, yeah. no, it didn't go. That's right. You have those memories. 
memories and his love. Aren't you thankful God leaves us with memories and allows us to think back? Sometimes it's the smell. For me, it's breakfast food. I can smell bacon and it takes me back to growing up and being with my grandparents or Daddy, when he was in charge of breakfast on Saturdays, it was Cairo syrup and toast and butter. You all know about Cairo syrup. <coughs> Nowhere on the table was it nutritious, but it was great. We loved it when Dad was in charge of breakfast. Those kind of memories, uh, they, they stick with you, you know. Dads are so important. A dilemma for a pastor on Mother's Day and Father's Day is... What do you speak on? How far do you go? We're walking through Romans, and do you talk about dads? Do you talk about being a son or a daughter? Do you talk about your heavenly father? What is it about? And one of the things that I was reminded of in this convention is that one of our most important tasks is to lead you to the throne and to move you forward in your walk with God. So that's my endeavor today, and we're going to walk just a little bit further in Romans in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4 which actually talks about how we're to treat our siblings, our spiritual siblings. So it points more to our Heavenly Father and what He expects of His children. So we're going to talk about that and see what the most perfect Father, the only perfect Father, is like and what He expects of His sons and daughters today. So uh, let's, let's jump into that if you would. Go to Romans 14. And um, we'll, we'll start there and move forward. And I, I wanted to uh, read the text and then share a couple things with you. If I could. Romans 14, verses 1 through 4 says this. Now, ex and, and when we have a, a conjunction like now or um, something that ties it to something that just happened, should we back up and, and kind of review what was going on there? Yes, we will in just a second. But it says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In these four, four verses, Paul is writing as the Holy Spirit inspires him to do so in practical application of all the things that we've learned in the first 12 chapters of Romans. And this is how we treat brothers and sisters in Christ. Our daddy, our Abba Father, has a prescription as to how his children are to treat one another. Okay? And that's what this is about. And he says, let me just back up, as I stated earlier, it says, now accept. So let me back up into chapter 13, verse uh, 13, which says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity or sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Now accept the one who is weak in faith. It continues on. Paul didn't write in chapter and verse. He was writing a letter. We have it in chapter and verse because it's easier to reference. So you have to just read it through as Paul is writing here about the spiritual aspect of life and the fleshly aspect. And he said, listen, accept someone into your congregation that may not be as mature in their walk or far along in their walk, but don't do it for the purpose of straightening them out. Y'all ever try to straighten somebody out? Y'all ever had somebody try to straighten you out? All right, that's a two-way street, isn't it? I want to read something here uh, about this text. And um, there's some interesting uh, examples here, illustrations that I want to give to you today. But this is, this is the first one. Debating the debatable. You know there's some absolutes, right? In God's holy word, absolutes. There's also some things that we have conviction about, we have opinion about, we have a talk about dads and moms. We, we learn some things as children that that was just how it is. And then we get older and somebody 
kind of pushes us in that and says, well, that's not just how it is. And wait a minute, that is because mama or daddy said so. And we have to do a little digging. There are some things that are debatable, and there are some things that are not. They're absolute. Well, this writer here says that debating the debatable, why um, it is that we should accept those who are weaker in faith um, without disputing with them over debatable matters. Without disputing with them about debatable matters. Because God has accepted them, which is what this passage says. There may be issues that need to be addressed, but our acceptance of fellow believers must not be based on the level of one's faith. I'm not talking about absolute stuff. We're talking about debatable stuff. How you wear your hair. How you dress. Okay? What kind of music you listen to. What do you look like? Okay? Have we ever done that? Yes. Should you wear a hat in the building? Should you have earrings? Should there be a ring in your nose or in your ears? You, these things we learn, okay? Their, their opinions, their tradition, their things that we were taught one way or the other. All right. Don't be throwing stuff. I just got back. Okay. <laughs> as a new believer, this is a true story. As a new believer in my 20s, um, and, and this, uh, this is coming from Stephen Runge, uh, in my 20s, I came into the church with a fair amount of baggage, he says. Lingering sin, issues that needed to be addressed. I was doing my best to spend time with God daily to get involved in ministry and to share my newfound faith with others. But I still had rough edges that needed smoothing out. Not surprisingly, the folks at church figured this out well, and it was interesting to see the differences in how various people addressed my weaknesses. Some boldly pointed out the areas they believed I needed to change. Others brought me under their wings, invited me into their homes, and spent time with me. The first group told me about their faith and what they thought of mine, whereas the second group modeled their faith by sharing their lives with me. Over time, issue after issue, God continued the process He had begun the day I confessed my sin and accepted Jesus as my Savior. And you can guess which group of folks proved most helpful as I sorted through those issues. Sound familiar? Does it sound like something we understand? There's a difference in telling people they're wrong or they need to change or showing them how uh, they come up short in our estimation than there is in sharing our lives with them and demonstrating before them what it is to live a life trusting Christ walking in the means to him, being a mature Christian. Would you expect a two-year-old to act like a 40-year-old? <laughs> no. Okay. What's the difference? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> um, I don't know, because I'm almost 60, so I don't know. Um, I noticed one thing in this convention that I never noticed before. There were a ton of young couples with children. A lot of the missionaries who had four, five, six, and seven children running around everywhere, and there, was this, there were several grandparents who had brought their grandchildren to the convention. So children everywhere, which is wonderful and refreshing to see. And the upstairs part of the convention had this children's world, and they were having a blast up there. I don't know what all they were doing, but they were having a good time. And during the business part of, of this, we were in the largest room I'd ever been in in my life. The one in Nashville was huge, but not this big. I don't know how far it covered. But we had a massive platform in the middle of the room. I mean massive. Then we had a screen way off to the right and way off to the left for those that couldn't see well. And then there was an additional screen on that side and another additional screen on that side that went even further. It was a massive room. And on one side there were no chairs and that's where the children were hanging out. They were just having a blast. Why? Because they can't sit in a business meeting for two days. They can't sit in a worship service for an hour and a half without moving. We would not expect a two, three, four, five-year-old child to sit still and listen. We can't hardly do that, right? The Bible says here to receive your brothers and sisters into your family, into your congregation, Understanding that not everybody's the same age spiritually, not everybody's the same level. So if they if they act like a an immature Christian, 
Don't try to make them act like a mature Christian. Teach them by investing in them, spending time with them. That's what discipleship is about. Do you think Jesus, when he called those fishermen from the seashore and the tax collector from his office and those other guys, do you think he said, now listen, we're going to be in some pretty important places with a lot of people watching. Okay, social media is a hot thing. So y'all need, need to hear the words you can and can't use. Here are the attitudes you can and can't use. I want y'all to study this, go through this six-month training, and then come along. No. He said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There's a process. Come as you are, and I'm going to transform you in the process. So the Bible here is telling us that there's a difference in pointing fingers and requiring people to be a certain level spiritually than investing in them and living the life before them that they would catch what's going on. And the Holy Spirit does the transforming and grows them in their faith. Okay. I was going to share a personal story, but I won't. So I'll move on to the next thing here. Uh, because I remember as a, as a young man um, entering my first vocation in the church, I had no clue of what to do, what was expected. <laughs> And the next time, I, I was only there a short time in Garden City, and I applied for a full-time ministry here in a large church in Conway when I graduated Coastal. And the word that pastor got was he's as green as a gourd, <laughs> which means he's very inexperienced. And, and just beginning in his faith, he was right. The person that told him that was accurate. I didn't know it, but I had a lot to learn. But if someone hadn't hired me or, or taken me under their wing, I would have never learned. And thankfully, I've had some great mentors along the way and disciples, which I'm so thankful for. Um, criticism. Uh, we talk about criticism sometimes in our world, but this text talks about criticism in the church. Why do we criticize? Why do we point fingers? Do we do that sometimes? There was a pastor one time that dressed up as a homeless person and sat out front of the congregation outside of the building before the service started to see who would speak to him and who wouldn't. And he had ragged clothes on and he had messed his face up and disguised himself and very few people talked to him. Some wanted to leave, but nobody invited him in. And they got time for the service to start. They did their preliminary stuff, their singing and offering and so forth. It came time for the pastor to speak and they're wondering where he is and all of a sudden this homeless man comes walking down the aisle that's on the platform and comes to the microphone and begins to speak and they realize it's their pastor and all of a sudden this heavy conviction falls on those that had just spoken to that man about leaving but never invited him in. That's what this text is talking about. Okay, This is an example um, that I want to share with you. It's, it's from a uh, database, uh, it's called Leadership Ministries Worldwide, but it's from someone that I think you'll recognize the name of. God's love is always at work building people up, not tearing them down, even though character assassination is common, even popular in our culture. God insists that believers live by a different set of rules. You know that? You're aware of that. We don't live by the rules that the culture dictates to us. We live by a different set of rules that God's Word dictates. So he says in his book, I Was Wrong, former PTL president and television personality Jim Baker, y'all remember Jim Baker, who was sent to prison for fraud, writes this. Not long after my release from prison, I joined Franklin Graham and his family at his parents' Old Log Mountain home for dinner. Ruth Graham, Billy's wife, had prepared a full course dinner. We talked and laughed and enjoyed a casual meal together like family. During our conversation, Ruth asked me a question that required an address, physical address. I reached into my back pocket and pulled out an envelope. My wallet had been taken when I went to prison. I, I had not owned a wallet for over four and a half years. As I fumbled through the envelope, Ruth asked tenderly, Don't you have a wallet, Jim? This is my wallet, I replied. Ruth left the room and returning with one of Billy's wallets. Here's a brand new wallet Billy has never used. I want you to have it, she said. I still carry that wallet to this day, Jim said. 
Over the years, I have met thousands of wonderful Christian men and women, but never anyone more humble, gracious, and in a word, real than Ruth Graham and her family. Kindness does not have to be uh, extravagant to mean a great deal to people. Someone once wisely cautioned soldiers not to shoot their own wounded. As soldiers for Christ, we above all, all others, should heed the words, these words of wisdom. Could the Grahams have set Jim Baker down and gave him a lecture? Could they have given him a speech and you got what you deserved and you asked for all this and all the people that were disillusioned and could they have given him that speech? Yes. Absolutely. But he writes in the book about the kindness and the grace that was demonstrated to him by this prominent pastor's wife who, as Billy Graham said himself, one of the godliest women he'd ever met, one of the godliest people he'd ever met in his life was his, his wife, Ruth. Is it important to be kind to one another? Yes. Yes. John Whitmer, which I, I quote fairly often, says this about this text. Christians are at different levels of spiritual maturity. They also have a diverse background that color their attitudes and practices. Sometimes it helps to find out why people are the way they are. The first lesson to learn in living harmoniously with other Christians, therefore, is to stop judging others. The focus in these verses that we read, 1 through 4, is on him whose faith is weak. The one being weak in faith, which appears in the emphatic first person and the sentence, which means keep on taking to yourselves this person, except keep on taking to yourselves such a person without passing judgment on disputable matters or debatable matters. Quit taking issue with people over things that don't matter, that are not absolute, that are disputable. But don't take them in for the purpose of quarreling with them about opinions. A believer with certain scruples is not to be welcomed into the fellowship with the intent of changing his or her views or opinions by quarreling with them about those opinions. Is it important for us to be kind to one another? To get along? To try to see others as God sees others? To recognize we're in different stages of our spiritual walk and journey? To receive someone who may be weaker or more, more immature in their faith, but not for the purpose that we can straighten them out? but for the purpose that we have the opportunity and privilege to live a life in front of them that guides them and leads them toward Christ. Show them what it means to live a life that's fully devoted to God. Okay. You all are real quiet. Makes me real nervous. That's all right. I want to share one more story with you before we, we start to close here. And I love this story. It's, it's hilarious, but it's true. And it's true of us. In our culture, in our world, unfortunately, uh, so many times, again, it's about criticism. Criticism is an all too common occurrence, even among believers. It's easy to look at someone else's situation or way of doing things and offer a creative comment. Creative comment. Why do you do it that way? What's wrong with you? <laughs> do it the way I do it. That's the right way, right? Creative comment without knowing all the facts. And note that we never know all the facts. You understand that? You never know all the facts about somebody else. We assume a whole lot. But we never know all the facts about why people do the things they do. What triggers them in a way, in a spiritual way, to brokenness or sadness or anger or happiness. What, what is it that fuels that? We never know all the facts. The following humorous tale illustrates human nature all so well. The story is told of an old man whose grandson rode a donkey while they were traveling from one city to another. The man heard some people say, Would you look at that old man suffering on his feet while that strong young boy is totally capable of walking? So then the old man rode a donkey while the boy walked. And he heard some people say, would you look at that, a healthy man making the poor young boy suffer. <laughs> Can you believe it? So the man and the boy both rode the donkey. And they heard some people say, would you look at those heavy brutes making that poor donkey suffer. 
So they both got off and walked until they heard some people say, Would you look at that waste? A perfectly good donkey not being used. <laughs> no matter what you do, someone will always criticize it. You know, you know that. The point here is that it can't be us. It shouldn't be us. We talk about how we relate to one another, how we relate to the world, and the different parts of relationships. But this text is specifically talking about how we are to relate to one another, and that being people of weaker faith. And just saying that, it's not for us to go around saying, yep, you're weaker faith, you're weaker. That's not it at all. It's saying, listen, be careful how you treat your brothers and sisters, not requiring them to be like you are, or worse. An old Chinese proverb states, if everyone sweeps in front of his own house, then the whole street will be clean. We all have ideas about how other people should behave or what they should do or say, but the Bible clearly teaches that every individual will have to account for himself or herself and no one else but before Christ. Only Christ can rightfully judge a person's works, which include criticizing and judging others. Is that something that you and I need to pray about? Is it something we should pray about? How we treat our brothers and sisters. Why do people come in this, this church building on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights and their clothes are pretty, pretty nasty and raggedy? They don't look right. They don't talk right. Something's different about them. They don't know anything about the scripture. What do we do with them? We welcome them. We welcome them. And we love them best way we can. Does it make a difference if they come back here or if they go to a different church building or a different church? Does it matter where the rest of their walk goes as far as how we treat them? We have to see people with kingdom eyes. Not with Homewood eyes, all with Baptist eyes, but with kingdom eyes. And that's something I appreciate so greatly about the conference and the convention I just went to. We're Southern Baptists, that's our denomination. But that was not the crux of why we met or the, the, the point of, of why we were meeting. It was about the kingdom, the kingdom of God, which includes other denominations and people from different countries and different languages that look differently and act differently. The kingdom of God is, is very different than what we always think of sometimes. We have to receive people with the love that God received us with. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The last thing I want to share here with you about this particular passage is what do we do about it? We've, we've heard and seen what not to do. So what is the positive? What's the right thing to do toward our brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly those that may be brand new in the faith? Here's an example. And this comes from Dr. Jeremiah. And he quotes 2 Timothy 2, 2. Which says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. One of the things that I heard several times during the convention was call out the called. Go to those who are, who are being called by God. Give them opportunity to serve. Give them um, ample uh, resources to be used so that they can go forward in their service and their ministry to reach others. Dr. Jeremiah says this, Nothing will help you grow in your Christian faith more than mentoring. Did you know that? That's one of those dynamics of God is nothing that's going to help you grow in your Christian walk more than focusing on somebody else's Christian walk and mentoring them. Maybe that word intimidates you, but it's simply doing what Paul wanted Timothy to do. Teach others what you have learned. Perhaps there's a lonely young person who would become a kind who... who um, would welcome a kind word or a class of children to teach or a child or grandchild who would memorize a Bible verse if encouraged to do so. Is there a kid's team that needs a coach, a local school needing a volunteer, a college class that would enjoy some snacks, giving you an opportunity to mingle with them? Every church needs workers. Every worker can find a way to disciple someone else. Fill yourself with scripture first. Grow in wisdom and confidence and develop good insights. Then ask God to use you to encourage someone else in their spiritual formation. Adopt this biblical prayer today, which says, and this is from Psalm 71, verse 18. O God, do not forsake me 
until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. We are left here after we begin this journey with God to glorify Him by making disciples, being obedient to Him, following Him, evangelizing, telling the people about who He is, living a life before them, investing in other people's lives. You and I are not here just about us and our lives and the things that, in, that we're involved with. It's about other people. Do y'all get nervous sometimes about engaging in other people's lives? What if they ask a question we don't know the answer to? We just make it up. No, no. no what do we tell them? We don't know. I don't know, but I'll research it. We'll find out together. We'll find out the best we can. What else are we afraid of besides not knowing something they may ask about? Are we afraid of rejection? Afraid of lightning. You're afraid of the lightning. I agree with you, Michelle. They might be dead with you. That's right. Are we involved with other people in their lives? Do we come in contact with people on a regular basis? Well, I, I never go many places. This day and time, the Amazon people, the UPS people, the FedEx people come to my house every day, every <laughs> day, even though I told them, stay out of my driveway. <laughs> There's people that come every day. Amen? <laughs> when I was in Indianapolis, I got to ride in uh, an Uber four or five times and got to meet several different men and talk to them about the families and the children and the faith and different things. Captive audience. They were driving, but we were still in the same vehicle, so we couldn't get out. So we had some good conversations. We went out to eat, talked to the waiter. Um, there, there are a lot of people that come in our lives that God puts us in place to speak to. But this text goes beyond just a speaking to or a simple salutation where, Hi, how are you? Good, you, good day, see you, bye. It's an investing in people's lives. Who are we investing in? Who is it that we're spending time with? And this doesn't have to be anything immaculate, folks. We're not out there to impress anybody. It's simply to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to grab some lunch. i got to get something to eat anyway. You want to go with me? Um, I'm going fishing today. You, you want to go? Um, going shopping. Can, can you go? Hey, let's go. I was going to look at some tractors or something. You want to go? Are you interested in and as you go, which is what that word means in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, as you're going through this life, make disciples. Talk to them about the Lord. Demonstrate, model before them what it is to be a believer so that they can grow in their faith. That's how we relate to those of weaker faith. It's, it's demonstrating before them and what should be and what shouldn't be. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have had any disciples. Okay. He took them rough. Don't you know that those fishermen, those Peter, Peter demonstrates it several times. They had some words and some attitudes that didn't exactly fit in most church services. You understand? Jesus took them. He said, as long as you follow me, I'll, hold, I'll model before you and I'll demonstrate for you what this life is all about that I'm teaching you. And you'll get it. And after about three years, they got it. If you'll notice there in the apostles' writings and, and in the letters, they they got it step by step. They grew and matured in the faith that where initially uh, they still were them. And then they, you know, this thing about Jesus was new, and let's just see what this is about. And by the end of the ministry, when the church began, they had grown to the point in their lives to eventually they would give their life. For Jesus, for their faith. That wasn't how they started. That's how they ended. Because Jesus invested in their lives. Three years of his life. It's the same for us. Receive, brothers and sisters, into the body of Christ. Weep faith or not. Our job is the same. Our attitudes are the same. The end result that we hope for is the same. And that's their maturity and faith and their to God and them being able to disciple others.
True disciples disciple people who disciple people. It's an ongoing process. We're going to sing a song here as we close today. And, um, the song is important to our faith. It's important to our faith in that it says, Savior, lead me all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way He leads us. The question is, are we going to follow Him? Would you stand? Oh, there's always a church that relies on you, trusts in you, follows you no matter what, no matter where. 